بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أي لحبة في الله continuing on in our study of Qa'id al-Arba we reach the third principle and before entering into this important principle uh, a very important question was uh, has arisen and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the questioner and bless us all with ilm and nafi rustin taybu amal and mutaqabilan the question was what is the difference between shirk and kufr what is the difference between shirk and kufr? Ahabatifillah, as the ulama expound upon extensively in many of their books, kufr is more general than shirk. Kufr is more general than shirk. Meaning that all shirk is a type of kufr. If it involves the lesser, the minor shirk, like riya, showing off, or a, uh, a sh a striving to be, you know, gain fame or something like this, then this, in general, is the minor shirk, and is a lesser type of kufr as well. Likewise. If something is the major shirk, which takes a person out of the fold of Islam, of course this is the major kufr. But not all kufr, meaning disbelief, is shirk. For example, there are things which the ulama, some sins, and especially the fuqaha, Imam Nawawi, and many, many great imams throughout history, you'll find in their fiqh books that they have the ahkam al -riddah which is the rulings regarding those people who left the fold of Islam, the apostates. And in this chapter, you'll find details about those sins which the ulama, they refer to um, as al-ma'lum min adin bidurura, that these are things which are known in the religion by necessity. That if someone violates these sins, then they have disbelieved. For example, when a person makes something lawful in the Sharia, which Allah has made unlawful, and it is something which is very known in the religion. For example, even non-Muslims know Muslims do not drink alcohol. So for example, if a Muslim were to say <coughs> that or, or even greater than that, uh, uh, eating uh, pork. If a Muslim were to say, well, pork is lawful for me. I believe in eating pork. Unless they were new to Islam, or some other excuse of ignorance, because those are one of the excuses, those are the, one of the things which prohibit from making takfir of someone, then the person who makes what Allah has decreed to be unlawful in the Qur'an or what the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam states as Muharram, if they make that lawful for themselves and that they believe, they make istihlal, they believe that to be lawful for them, that this is the major disbelief, although it's not shirk. And possibly from a wad you might be able to say shirk, that it involves with the uh, shirk of, of the rulership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something like this. But in general, you would say that this is not shirk, but that this is disbelief, that they are making what Allah has made unlawful, lawful, and vice versa. Likewise, if someone were to take the Qur'an, every Muslim knows this and knows the sanctity of the, the Qur'an, even those who have some mistakes with regards to the aqidah, of Ahlul Sunnah regarding the Quran, that they consider the Quran sacred and holy. 
So even if they make some ta'wil fasid, some wicked uh, understanding of the Quran, of, of you know about it being the kalam of Allah, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if you were to put the mushaf down on the floor, uh, a person, wa'iyadhan billah min dhalika, and they were to step on it intentionally, then this is not shirk, it's not uh, polytheism, but rather it is kufr. So hopefully that clarifies. So shirk involves, polytheism involves, worshipping Allah along with someone or something else. Or worshipping someone or something else besides Allah. So either you're sharing in worship, uh, you are attributing this divinity to Allah and some other being or some other thing that was created, or you are diverting that worship solely to something else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both of those are polytheism, the major shirk, and it takes a person out of the fold of Islam. So that is what distinguishes shirk from kufr, polytheism from disbelief. And that all polytheism involves disbelief. It's more specific, whereas all kufr is not shirk. So hopefully that's clarified, and I'll give you a, another quick example with regards to the issue of uh, disbelief or kufr, <coughs> and as there was a question related to this, but what the, the, the issue of the mas'ala that came up, for example, and I've spoken about it before in other durus, was an issue, for example, of Saddam Hussein. And his, uh, he was a man that many scholars of Ahlul Sunnah had made takfir of because of his Hezbabathist principles, his principles of being a part of the, and a main leader of the regime of the Baathist uh, nationalist, socialist, uh, ideology. They had an ideology which totally is full of shirk and negates uh, key important principles of Islam in about regarding the rulership that the rulership is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but rather they believe the rulership was and the allegiance and the alliance was to the party. So without getting into extensive details for this reason uh, Imam bin Baz Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al Wadi, al Wadi, and uh, many other ulama had made made takfir of him. Those are ones that I know for sure that I've read their statements myself, and and listened to them many times. Especially Sheikh Muqbil Allah yarhamhu regarding this issue. So they made takfir of him. So the issue uh, arises: What happens when? someone uh, has left the religion of Islam, whether they did it intentionally or unintentionally. So Saddam Hussein considered himself a Muslim, also a Ba'athist, but the ulama of Ahl sunnah declared, decreed takfir of him. So then the controversy came about when those Shia Rafida, they hung Saddam Hussein when they caught him, and uh, um, this was uh, videoed and is all around the world and probably still on the YouTube. So the issue came up for, uh, you know, what about this man who was a disbeliever or who had apostated or what have you? How do they, how does he enter the fold of Islam again? Or was he a Muslim? This was the issue that actually came up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So the question was posed to two of our ulama from Ahl Sunnah, uh, Alama Ahmed al Najmi, rahmatullahi, and Sheikh Ubaid al Jabri, Hafidullah Ta'ala. And with regards to that, their answers were different. And this also shows you the beauty of Islam and the beauty of not being so harsh with one another, especially about m m issues of ijtihad, issues that that are not issues of necessarily ittiqad, 
not issues of creed and Al-Qaeda, but these are issues pertaining to uh, rulings and, and fiqh rulings and mu'amalat and things like this, that in many issues, as Ibn Uthaymin said, that they are uh, most, he said, أَكْثَرْ مَسَائِلَ الْفِقْ ذَنِّي He said most of the issues in fiqh, they are ذَنِّي, meaning that they don't necessarily, um, the nas is not specifically, specifically, 100% can be um, understood to be evidence for that for that opinion so meaning that the opinions that there's some room there's some itchy had in there that they are not it's not like uh, you know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, says wa aqimu salat this is muhkama Allah has commanded to establish the prayer there's no other way uh, generally to understand that that's well known and agreed upon in the religion there's no a debate to say, well, well, establishing the prayer really means uh, du'a, or establishing the prayer means um, something else. But no, it's very understood. Everyone knows what establishing the prayer and knows about the five daily prayers. But in something, in many thick issues, the issue may have some room for uh, debate between the ulama with their various means of understanding those fiqh masail. So regarding this issue, uh, Imam Ahmed uh, Imam Ahmed al Najmi he mentioned, he said that inshallah, if Saddam Hussein he made this shahada, then inshallah he was a Muslim. This is the in in essence what uh, Imam uh, Ahmed al Najmi Rahmatullah said. And Sheikh Obaid Sheikh Obaid had different tafsil or different details. And he said that it was necessary for Saddam Hussein to distance himself from those principles of kufr that he espoused before, in addition with that statement of the testimony of faith. And they both have strong arguments in what they're saying, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But, uh, so this shows us, anyhow, uh, the importance of being not so harsh with one another when it comes to issues of ijtihad and the hukum on someone. If I see someone as a, a, an innovator and you disagree with me, does that mean I have to cut you off? Does that mean I have to attack your your yourself? Because this is not what Islam, the whole history of Islam and the ulama, and if you want stronger delil uh, or uh, details about this issue, go to some of the books of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and you'll find these issues uh, detailed. So, Ahabatifillah, getting back on, moving to the third principle. I wanted to answer that question as I answered it before, and unfortunately the recordings were uh, distorted, so this is why we are going back over this principle again, the third principle. And Imam Ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahmatullahi, he said, in mentioning the, those principles of shirk, he said, the Prophet Wasallam encountered people who worshipped many different things. Some worshipped the angels, some worshipped prophets and saints, while others worshipped rocks and trees, still others the sun and the moon. And he fought them all and did not differ between them. The evidence for this is a statement of the Almighty, and fight them until there is no more fitna, and the religion will all be for Allah. And fitna in this verse, Ahabatifillah, as is explained in a, another verse in the Quran, a fitna, a shirk, that fitna, the dhulm and the fitna that's referred to here is shirk, is disbelief. And then Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahmatullahi he said, the evidence that the sun and moon were worshipped is the saying of the Almighty, and from his signs is the night and the day. وَمِنْ آيَاتِ يَلَيْنَ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ لَا تَشْجِرُوا لِشَمْسِ وَلَا تَشْجِرُوا لِشَمْسُ وَلَا لِلْقَمَرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And from his signs is the night and the day, the sun and the moon. Do not prostrate to the sun or the moon. Prostrate to Allah who created them. If it is him, you really worship. The evidence they worship the angels is Allah's statement, 
you were not commanded to take the angels and the prophets as lords. And the evidence that they worship prophets is a statement of the law of the Almighty, when the law will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take my mother and me as gods besides the law? He will say, glory be to you. It was not for me to say, which I had no right to utter. Had I said such a thing, you would surely have known it. You know what is in my inner self, and I do not know what is in yours. Truly you are the all-knower of all that is hidden. And the evidence that they worshipped the saints is a statement of the Almighty. Those whom they call upon, like Jesus and Mary, those worship beings, desire a means of access to their Lord, as to which of them should be nearest. And they hope for his mercy and fear his torment. And the evidence that they worship rocks and trees is a statement of Allah the Almighty. Have you considered Allah, wal Uzza, and Manat the, th the third? And then the hadith of Abi Waqif al Laythi, who said, uh, We left Hunayn with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we were new to Islam. The pagans had a tree they used to devote themselves to and hang their weapons upon called that al Anwad. So we passed by a tree and said, O Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, Ajalna that al Anwad, Kamalahum that al Anwad. They said, O Messenger of Allah, make for us a that al Anwad. Come, similar to the way they have a that al Anwad. Sheikh Ahmed said, uh, or, or regarding this, uh, something that's very important is to understand, here's, this was the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, and this Hadith illustrates for us the principle of Udr uh, Bijahil, of the excuse of ignorance when reg regarding making takfir of people that if, and this is why this issue is looked at by the ulama, the scholars of Islam and the judges, that they look and make these, uh, these very delicate issues, they look and they, and they find out before they make an issue of takfir. They established the hajjah, qama alayhi la hajjah. They established the, the proofs and evidences to the individual who has fallen into the major kufr. Because this would have been major kufr to ask for uh, to ask for blessings, you know, ask for the permission to seek blessings from a tree. Because that's what the, the mushrikun, they had a protection for their weapons that they believed was a protection. So the Muslims that were new to Islam, and this is why uh, Abi Waqid al-Laythi, radiallahu ta'ala, he, uh, he said, we left Hanayn with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we were new to Islam. We were new to Islam. So they had newly entered the fold of Islam. So obviously they didn't know all of these pr uh, these principles. You know, the, uh, and, and, and they were just, f f just new from shirk. So they weren't accountable in that sense, the Prophet ﷺ was amazed at that. He he made inkar. He did not just accept it, but he made a strong inkar as well. He did say, Subhanallah, that you said what the people of Musa said to him uh, regarding uh, this type of uh, bar, uh, tabarak or, or intercession. And then he said, Let tabi'una sunnah man kana kablukum. You will follow the path of those who came before you. Meaning that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, would also, within the Ummah, there will be those who revert back to shirk. So never think that shirk has been erased from the Ummah. Shirk is erased by Islam. Islam is all about the worship of Allah alone. However, many people who adhere to Islam or people who consider themselves Muslims have fallen into shirk. And what I mean by consider themselves Muslims, those people who worship, who do grave worship, and 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 so forth, and seek intercession from saints and so forth like this, that there are those of them uh, from from who who would consider themselves Muslim, but in fact they worship those saints, sarih. You know that there's no excuse for them, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. So this hadith shows us that the excuse of ignorance. So for example, if someone a new Muslim. He doesn't know. He enters the fold of Islam through some extreme Sufis. This can happen in the UK, it can happen in America, it can happen in Canada, it can happen definitely in Yemen, in Egypt, and in many places. 
So they leave disbelief of their former disbelief, their former deen or religion, or if they didn't have one, and they come into the fold of Islam. But with that testimony of faith, they enter right into a Sufi, an extreme Sufi sect. Maybe they, at the hands of some uh, Naqshbandi or some some Turk, some Tariqa uh, of the Sufi Tariqa. And with this, perhaps they tell them, well, you need to go to Sheikh Nasser and uh, make bay'ah to him and supplicate to him. And you need that picture of the Sheikh so you can cry to him and seek his assistance as he's on Hajj tonight. And tomorrow he'll be on Hajj again. And, you know, all of these kind of shirki added things that are built on lies and kevin. That perhaps someone could enter the fold of Islam based on that. So then they didn't know. They were new. And they would have the excuse of ignorance, bi uh, ta'ala, and they would need to be told that this is not correct, this is not from Islam, this is shirk, this is kufr, this is disbelief, and this is what real Islam says. It is not about worshipping or associating partners with Allah Azza wa Jal, and those are acts that humility and so forth that you're showing to your shaykh it was only reserved to Allah, that kind of khudu. Well, that uh, and and you know that you, that's a level of ibadah and worship. That type of humbleness goes to Allah Azza wa Jal only. So that would need to be clarified. Sheikh Ahmed Al Najmi, rahmatullahi he says this principle illustrates that everything which is supplicated to other than Allah, regardless of whether it is, an, it is angels, prophets, pious saints, or trees, rocks, or anything else that is worshipped, they are all incapable of assisting those who worship them with what they request or grant them in alternative. And the law of the Almighty has already mentioned that anyone who is supplicated to besides him does not possess anything, not even a little, when he said, and those whom you invoke or call upon instead of him own not even the thin membrane over a date seed. If you invoke them, they hear you not. And if they could hear you, they could not grant your request. And on the day of resurrection, they will disown your worshipping them. And none can inform you like him who is well acquainted with everything. And the most magnificent said, O you who believe, here is an example, so take heed of it. Verily, those who you invoke other than Allah cannot even create a fly, even if they gather together to do so. There are many other uh, verses which illustrate that those who are invoked... Uh, who are invoked besides Allah are unable to fulfill the request of those who worship them due to their frailty and weakness, and they are also incapable of preventing harm or benefiting themselves. So how about other than them? Those who are worshipped besides Allah, no matter what their status is, they are unable to fulfill our request, and it constitutes polytheism, shirk, by worshipping or supplicating to them. It does not matter if a person supplicates to an angel or to Jesus or to Muhammad or to a statue, an idol, rock, or dead saint. It all constitutes shirk and violates Islamic monotheism, meaning tawheed. This is all a violation of tawheed, tawheed al ibad, tawheed al uluhiya. This is a violation. So, regardless, because what you'll find the argument and why many people. Uh, in the day, in the times of Muhammad and the Wahhab, and after him, people like uh, uh, Dahlan, who's a famous uh, detractor or person who criticized Muhammad ibn the Wahhab, he came about 50 years after Muhammad ibn the Wahhab. And I read his book. He has a book, a famous book. Uh, his his many treaties he wrote. He was a uh, a, a big sheikh in Mecca from Ahl Bidah, a Sufi, extreme Sufi. So he wrote a, a, a famous book called Fitna to Wahhabiyyah. And this was written 50 years after Muhammad ibn al-Duhab, rahmatullahi alayhi, died approximately. And in it, he talks about, you know, that this was the traditions of Islam, of, you know, worshipping, uh, or, or not, they didn't consider it worship, but, you know, these are people who said, la ilaha illallah, and you're fighting them, and they, uh, you know, sought intercession. And, and a lot of their arguments is that they say, not just Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab, but they say Ahl Sunnah and uh, the Salafis and what have you of this t day and age, that they say, hey, you guys don't venerate the sh the, the the saints, the, the the righteous, pious people 
who are throughout time in the Ummah. You're not giving them their haq, but instead you actually hate them. Or that you hate the Prophet ﷺ. You're not celebrating his birthday. You're not uh, crying and supplicating to him and seeking his intercession. But Ahl Sunnah says, La. He says that all of those things, seeking intercession from the Prophet ﷺ in this life, is prohibited. It's haram. That that is a way, that is shirk, if you are supplicating to the Prophet ﷺ and asking for his intercession. Instead, that will come about in the hereafter. And likewise, as far as the saints, that those people who are affirmed that they were righteous people, that Ahl Sunnah respects them, they love, we love the ulama, the ulama that passed on from the Salaf and those later throughout the history of Islam, those great pious people. We love the pious people, but we don't love them to the extent that we seek anything from them except whatever knowledge they left behind. So. We seek to gain knowledge from their books and whatever is left behind from, their, not from their, their knowledge that they left behind. And we seek that knowledge to come closer to Allah because that knowledge that they have in their books were knowledge about Islam, knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, explaining the text, the nusus of kitab wa sunnah. So those things, we, uh, we respect them, but we do not take it to the level of any kind of ibadah. We do not venerate them to any level of ibadah. Humility, going to their graves, supplicating to them, making tawaf around their graves, uh, giving sacrifice to their graves. All of those things are forms of shirk. And regardless, if you worship like the Hindus worship the elephant, I mean, they worship the cow, and some and they, some of them they worship the rats and they have many various de deities regardless of whether you worship those deities or you worship the righteous saints in Islam or you worship the Prophet وسلم, or you worship Jesus وسلم, all of that constitutes shirk all of that constitutes shirk and that's what the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, illustrate for us and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil uh, and anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.